So good to have you here. I'm uh, Ren Weschler. I'm the director of the New York Institute for the Humanities. And along with the Humanities Initiative, we are here at NYU. We are very, very happy to have you here. Uh, my general rule over the last 12 years, going back to uh, some of you may even remember the, the David Hockney Symposium, uh, in which he was arguing that all sorts of old masters used, used uh, all sorts of optical devices, um, which was a fairly controversial theory. And we, we, we did three days on that one. And uh, this kind of is the bookend to that. But uh, my general rule is always that we try to find the third rail of any possible discipline and then grab it and grab as many other people as we can and see what happens. Uh, and so that's going to be this kind of day, I think. Uh, first of all, t please turn off your, your uh, cell phones. Uh, and secondly, um, uh, one other thing I'll announce now, and I'll announce it several times, is that outside, this is free, and outside we have an independent bookseller. Those are very rare species, and you are to go outside and buy books during the breaks, because that is how we keep culture going in this country. That's all I'll say about that. OK, quickly about how this is going to go. Um, uh, a few years ago, I, I read this book of Ben Binstock's, uh, which I thought was, was, yeah, it's right there. Yeah, let's show it to everybody. For sale outside by an independent bookseller. Anyway, um, and I thought it was really interesting, and I was very eager to see what people were saying about it. And I was just stunned to see it had been out for a few years already. It had been out, and nobody was saying anything about it. And that continued to be the case, which bewildered me. Uh, and um, I mean, I think, I think you'll agree when you hear the theory that it's a very, very interesting theory no matter what. I'm, and I'm willing to say that I myself am agnostic on whether it's, it's uh, true or not. But, but the fact that it's not being talked about I thought was interesting. It was even more interesting when I began to organize this, this event today that almost all the Vermeer people, the big people that you know about, Walter Liedtke, Svetlana Alpers, Arthur Wheelock, and so forth, don't want to be part of this discussion for reasons that we can talk about, uh, and basically more or less dismiss it, the theory out of hand, um, which I also thought was interesting uh, as a response, and is not that different from other sorts of things that I've, we've come upon in the past. So anyway, my, my, my way of dealing with this is to grab the third rail of this and to invite all sorts of different types of people, which we've done, and you'll, we'll go through them as the day goes, goes on. But I thought the way we would begin is to invite Ben, uh, ben Stock uh, to come and talk. By the way, we're not going to give long introductions to people. The, that's what the flyers are for. Um, uh, you have their biographical, introduction, uh, biographical information. Um, but I thought we'd invite Ben to talk for an hour or so uh, to bring out uh, the elements of his theory. Then he and I will have a conversation for a bit. I will, in fact, channel several of the people I've mentioned who don't want to be here, but they would talk to me for some reason. Um, and uh, I'll ask some of their questions. But then we'll take a break. Then we'll come back. <coughs> and we'll have a group of, of art historians, uh, art critics, in one panel, then another panel of artists, then a panel of journalists, because I think, parenthetically, this is a more general problem in academia, how things get received or not received, and how this sort of thing works. Uh, and then at the end of the day, uh, uh, around 5.15, 5.30, uh, we will have Anthony Grafton, who I've just described as the London whale. <laughs> he will swallow it all and, and uh, help us make sense of what we've been through. Uh, anyway. So without further ado, uh, Mr. Ben Binstock. Thank you, Ren. Thanks, everyone, for coming. It's, uh, <clears throat> it's really a thrill, probably. <laughs> this is one of the big thrills of my life. So uh, good morning and welcome. I want to start today. The way uh, Ren does, I also want to thank the participants who are, it's incredibly generous of them, especially after what we heard. People are, don't want to come. So the people who come and from another discipline or put themselves, grab the third rail, wonderful people. <laughs> uh, I want to start the way Ren does his classes with a poem. I've just been taking 
Ren's, sitting in on Ren's class at NYU. He calls it the morning prayer. In this case, it's the conclusion of a late poem by Robert Lowell, Epilogue, which can serve as a succinct summary of Vermeer's art as well as our task here today. Pray for the grace of accuracy Vermeer gave to the sun's illumination, stealing like the tide across a map to his girls solid with yearning. We are poor passing facts, warned by that to give each figure in the photograph his living name. Now in this introduction, I want to take you all on a tour, a virtual tour of the Frick Collection Museum, which is going to extend out into a tour of the life work of Johannes Vermeer, as well as his daughter, whose name graces this conference. So let's all take the subway up to the Frick. We go past the impressive lawn facing the Central Park and in, up the stairs. And then we can wait in the interior court until everyone arrives. And when you come in, just around the corner at the bottom of the stairway, which leads up to uh, Mr. Frick's former bedroom, where they have some, you can, I used, they used to have some materials there, but I guess it's all been moved to the library. I once looked at some files there. Uh, you get to the bottom of the stairs, and you get to what I call the Vermeer Wall. And this is an old photograph. There's no photography allowed in the Frick, and I wanted to stick with their policy. So the painting nearest to one, to nearest to us, Ver Vermeer's Soldier and Laughing Girl, was clearly the one that Lowell referred to in his poem, the sun's illumination stealing like a tide across the map. His phrase, grace of accuracy, succinctly distills Vermeer's inimitable synthesis, the observed details, the map, its qualities as a physical object, the elaborately and brilliantly colored costumes, the expressions and psychologies of the faces, the laughing or smiling girl, solid with yearning, are subtly mediated by poetic restraint, dissolved lines, and the principle of relative color discovered by Vermeer a few years before Newton. All this is contained in a perfectly balanced composition, stilled and timeless, as if for eternity. The poet Lowell also claimed that we were, we were warned to give each figure in the photograph his living name. And I propose that Vermeer's models in this instance were his wife, uh, Katerina Bolmes, and her brother, uh, Willem, with his back to us. And you actually have, uh, hopefully, all uh, a, a handout. And we have a uh, little inside, uh, I don't know what we'd call this, a, a bylaga, a, a supplementary material. And here we have these comparisons of details of faces in the painting. So this is what I'm pointing to you. There's a Frick soldier and laughing girl, supposedly Katerina, or possibly. And this would be her, her brother, Will Willem. And we'll hear more about the family, obviously, in due course. This is one of my two foundational theses, that Vermeer used his family as models for all of his paintings further refining a strategy of Rembrandt, with whom he studied a few years earlier, around 1654, and whose paintings he knew well. That's, for example, the Bathsheba, with Rembrandt's wife, or common-law wife, as Bathsheba, from 1654. Vermeer would have seen that. Unlike Rembrandt, and probably the other prodigal son painting in the studio, unlike Rembrandt, the mature Vermeer painted only genre scenes, that is, scenes of everyday life. And what genre is is something that we're discussing today, I guess. More specifically, in his case, I propose the life of a painter whose art was the most central part of his life. Each of his paintings used family members as models, whether in the rooms of his house or urban landscapes like his little street. Previous authors have tentatively identified one or two of the figures of his scenes as family members, including the late Yale economic historian John Montius, who discovered so much vital information about Vermeer's family. He proposed, for example, Vermeer's milkmaid was based on the family maid, Tonic and Averpool. But no scholar has addressed this issue, aside from myself, in a systematic way or its significance. And the only published review of my book, Vermeer's Family Secrets, dismissed the idea as absurd. I now recognize that the way I presented my hypothesis as an obvious fact 
was less convincing, so I'm partly to blame <laughs> for what's called the thunderous silence, not only about my book, but about Vermeer's family. So I stand before you chastened and ask you to reconsider the question. Can we give these figures their living names? Perhaps the most famous example is Vermeer's Girl with a Pearl Earring, which will itself come to the frick this fall. So I think it's in San Francisco right now. Tracy Chevalier, in her best-selling novel of that name from 2000, later made into a film starring Scarlett Johansson, identified the model as the assistant of Vermeer's family made in his own secret model. But that story is a fiction. Was she not instead Vermeer's eldest daughter, Maria? We will return to this question. Right now, we're still in front of the Vermeer wall of the Frick Museum. The second large painting in the middle, Mistress and Maid, has since been moved to the Great Hall at the end of the corridor, which is sometimes used as a dining room. It was in Frick's day and still today, but mostly as a place for other large paintings. There you see it on the wall. The middle painting of the Vermeer wall has been changed many times uh, from, it was Van Gogh at one point, not sure it was Van Gogh, to uh, Corot, and right now it's a minder Hobama landscape with a mill. The far painting has always been Girl Interrupted, which is assigned to Vermeer. Now, could Lowell have praised this painting in the same way? Where are the light-filled interior, the subtle details, elaborate costumes, brilliant colors, compelling characters, the grace of accuracy? In place of stillness and timelessness, we are confronted as if interrupting her, an admittedly engaging, even strikingly modern conception but entirely uncharacteristic of Vermeer, one that likely, likewise gave rise to a novel and then a film of the same name, the source of Angelina Jolie's only Oscar. <laughs> Scholars have sought to justify these problems as either a function of uh, Vermeer losing his courage or overzealous cleaning resulting in the ruin of a Vermeer. These mutually contradictory explanations make no sense to me and themselves lack what Lowell would call the grace of accuracy. Vermeer certainly had weaker periods in paintings, but never ones that violated his characteristic principles in this way. And conversely, a restorer had no reason to erase a Vermeer painting, which does not account for what we're looking at, what is left over. I mean, why is there this underneath? Nor can cleaning remove a perspective scheme or three-dimensional bodies that can't transform elaborate costumes into simple plain cloths with exaggerated surface folds or render sheet music completely flat without texture. By the way, this is, you have it on your... I'm sorry that the... the uh, well, we've, we've, that's one of the reasons why we've got so many media. I'm going to talk about this. And, uh, but we have, for example, this painting right here. I'll put it up behind me. Can you see that? Or why? I could just put it right in front here. It doesn't really matter. But here's a small version. You have it here compared with Soldier and Laughing Girl. So that's what we're talking about. And uh, that's, that's one of the reasons why you see slides. Art historians are always saying, oh, if you could only see what's in the slide. <laughs> we, want you to, we want you to look at these paintings and expose them to light. Um, uh, and uh, you can see that there is all of these problems that I'm talking about, but I don't think that those are very successful, convincing explanations that it was somehow overcleaned. And uh, some more details. The painting of the Cupid on the back wall. Uh, and they, I'm sorry about it, but I think one of the uh, spirits of this third rail is we really don't mind taking uh, many different uh, uh, forms of approach, different media, all of which are imperfect. and but. That's whatever it takes to look at the painting, uh, we'll try to do. And I'm sorry about the slides. But uh, one of the things that you see here, and you can't, you really can't see it. <laughs> but, uh, and we have this, this painting over here. That's why I've got them all here. But uh, the uh, she behind here, if I only had this one slide. <laughs> Where is the, the uh, lady standing in a virginal? She's up here somewhere, but she's hiding. But you could see the Cupid right there. It's very color, beautiful color. And you could see that the Cupid here 
is kind of strangely gray tones. And also, the body is rather awkward and lumpy. And the hand is cut off by the top of the frame. That just, that's not something that you would get from over cleaning the picture. Uh, so I don't think it's, uh, it's really explaining it correctly. And this, this is not the only coincidence, which is there's also beautiful color of the painting in Braunschweig is coming through. But, and even with these rough forms, and uh, you can see there's, there's repetitions of elements, like this chair back appears here, and the woman is seated similarly to this one. And the man leaning over her is a kind of combination of this man standing behind her with the cloth in front of him and the other man who's leaning over. So it looks like it could be Vermeer or somebody else combining elements from a Vermeer painting. Uh, how, are we how are we to account for these problems? Oh, that's a much, much better. I thank you. Uh, we should step back for a moment at this point and ask how we even know about Vermeer at all. The dawn of modern art history, Théophile Touré, here are some details. You see that similar, uh, here I'm just showing you. Oh, that's good. You really can see that. Here's Théophile Touré. He discovered Vermeer, changing his opinion from a bizarre artist in 1858 to an incomparable original, an unknown genius in 1859, in relation to Vermeer's view of Delft, and soon after dedicated his life to recovering the painter's <coughs> oeuvre. Torre knew Soldier and Laughing Girl. He spoke about his paintings, Vermeer's paintings, in terms comparable to the poet Lowell. But roughly half of the paintings in his pioneering monograph from 1869 are now recognized as mistakenly assigned to Vermeer. And in the century and a half since this 1860s, scholars have gradually narrowed down, in a few cases, added examples to constitute Vermeer's uh, uh, current, more or less accepted oeuvre of 36 odd paintings. But uh, things have su changed surprisingly little in the representation of Vermeer's oeuvre in modern monographs, which of course reproduce paintings in color now, and in some cases, several at once. And there are also some more interesting examples, provocative examples, such as Ivan Guskell's Vermeer's Wager, which he might elucidate for us today. Uh, but most monographs uh, on Vermeer place his works in implicit order, one per page. But the matter is never explained, matter is never explained in terms of a coherent work by work, year by year chronological development. What's the relation among the paintings? How do they compare all together? I'm showing you. Vincent Desiderio's wonderful painting, Cocaine, a milk and honey land of art books, which I want you all to imagine are books on Vermeer. <laughs> Why no explicit chronology in these monographs? Well, first of all, art history is a conservative field, and it's still evolving. To my knowledge, the task has never been performed for the oeuvre of any historical painter, certainly not for Rembrandt or his best student and Vermeer's direct precursor, Carl Fabricius, as I've sought to do. And the traditional oeuvre catalogue raisonné, an old-fashioned French name that evokes the era of Touré, reviews individual paintings one after another. But the paintings aren't placed in direct relation to each other. No explanation is offered for the artist's gradual development. A second problem is that art historians have increasingly abandoned traditional connoisseurship which is uh, succinctly de defined by the famous connoisseur of Italian art, Bern Bernard Berenson. Uh, Rachel Cohen may be able to tell us something more about him. He defined connoisseurship as the comparison of works of art with a view to determining their reciprocal relationships. Instead of visually comparing works, which is what Berenson did, and for which photographic reproductions are crucial and make possible constructs undreamt of by Berenson, Scholars have increasingly come to rely on technical examination of the individual ob objects called technical art history. Uh, I believe this shift in emphasis is based on a misunderstanding of the nature of data, evidence, and scientific method, uh, issues to be discussed today by David Purple. Uh, I believe we need to return to reciprocal relations. And this, this is the comparison that's in your handout fold out. Third problem is there are economic, cultural, and institutional investments at stake in all this. And the Frick Museum vividly illustrates the problem. It's an exceptionally conservative institution, which is perhaps appropriately 
so to preserve this kind of house and its treasures. But obviously, it doesn't lend itself to uh, profound self-examination. Uh, it's kind of fun that the third rail runs through one of the, 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 the most old-fashioned heart of New York in some way, the most uh, beautiful house. Fourth, the task is genuinely difficult. I don't think the solution is e easy or obvious. I've certainly spent a lot of time on it. So we come to my second foundational thesis, along with the fact that Vermeer's family are recognizable as models in his paintings. The other one is that we have to put pa Vermeer's paintings in a logical and coherent order that reveals his gradual development. And the first and second theses are related since recognizing specific family members as models in the paintings helps us to arrange them. You can see, for example, if it's a daughter, we see her relative ages and try to look at it that way. I also feel we have to go in back and forth between, for example, comparing two large slides. You can look at details or on a holdout. And the idea of many paintings at once. That's part of the idea. I mean, if you take it seriously, let's have them out here. I, I wouldn't have been able to do this without Jerry Davis, another uh, participant. We barely got this here. Just getting them here is hard. Uh, so you can see it's a lot of trouble, but it's important. Uh, all of these paintings, the relative scale, these are the actual sizes of them. and. Uh, you got to put them in some order. Now, this is rough. I can't put them in an order, but I'm trying to do. This is something I just barely got together um, this yesterday, or we were cutting them today, and it's still pretty shabby. But it's, uh, I hope this is going to be a new uh, way of looking at this, which is it's on a kind of special paper. Uh, I can't remember, remember what photo text, I think it's called. But you can move it around. So I'm hoping this is going to be a prototype maybe for a pop-up book where people can move the paintings around themselves, because that's what this is about. Everybody should be able to look at this. And <clears throat> if you see something in the order that doesn't make sense, we're going over this. But you know, you give rough dates. I'm separating them out. Again, just to, the very gist of this is let's put all the cards on the table. I read somewhere on uh, somebody looked Google, Google text or whatever it's called. I saw at the Frick, some, one person had looked at my book, a man named Alan De Niro, and said, the whole premise of this book is a house of cards. And uh, that was the only one. So if you want to help me out, go on the Google book or whatever and give, give another one sentence summary. I don't know whether he looked at it, but I say, let's put the cards on the table. Let's play with the cards that were dealt. These are the cards. And the gist of it is, I think some don't belong. We can separate them out. That, I think, allows us to put the ones that are left over for Vermeer in order. I think it allows us to put the ones that don't fit in order. It allows us to relate the two of them. So we'll talk about that. But that's the idea here. I say to my students, if you see something, say something. If you see something that looks like it's out of order, obviously, or less obviously, let us know. And especially the participants, I'm happy to move these things around. Uh, so that's it. We're trying to look at all of these things and use different modes. Um, I'm showing you uh, a scale model reproduction. Uh, the, the, the old photograph of my, I'm in my NYU apartment not far from here in 2001. And I'm standing there for scale. But you can't really tell how tall I am. So I'm, I included my pug, Minnie, who was old and sick. She was sitting on the pillow there in front of the progress. She got up and stood in front of Vermeer's only representation of his dog, which is in the <laughs> Diana and her companions. Now, you'll see Diana and her companions is missing. I don't have some of the early big works. I don't have the view of Delphi. They're so big, it's very hard to move around. And here, for some reason, the, the poor brown tried painting, which I don't, it's called The Girl with a Wine Glass. I prefer to call it The Drinking Lesson, just to distinguish some of these paintings. But that one somehow didn't make it, so we're still blundering along. But we've got a lot of stuff covered. And, and weirdly enough, it's only a couple of months ago that I threw out these reproductions. I guess it's kind of a, some metaphor for something, because they were hanging around. I didn't think they were getting yellowing, nobody. But that, you have to make them all over again. And what a wonderful opportunity to do that for all of you, and especially thanks to Jerry Davis. This is one-fifth scale. So looking at all the paintings in this way, it is easier to recognize seven disparate misfit paintings. This is the. Uh, a, shot of my book from two pages where I have all of those up. Including Girl Interrupted, that would be this one here, here, which we must put aside in order to 
establish a logical, coherent development in Vermeer. And his soldier and laughing girl, which is up here, I say goes in between his milkmaid and the next painting, which I call the interrupted music. They call it the glass of wine. I just find those titles only are confusing. <clears throat> Doesn't really matter. Those are my, not, not the most important paintings. His gradual development was, in fact, <coughs> remarkably consistent and self-conscious. He portrayed progressively ambitious scenes. There's the three, I'm sorry. Milkmaid, Soldier and Laughing Girl, that painting in Berlin. Uh, you know, starting with a figure in the corner of a room, then two figures across the space. He's reintroducing the floor. I don't, but um, he, he actually started out extremely, uh, he reached a, a very high point relatively early on. I mean, if you're saying that the milkmaid, which I date earlier, that's one of the things, the gist of this is that a lot of paintings end up getting moved earlier. You see that after these early history paintings, he really already gets an incredible technical master. He's almost basically unsurpassed in Western art and is complicating things from there and goes through his own development. That's important to bear in mind when we're trying to look at the larger development of Vermeer and try to understand what the relation of these paintings. Uh, the misfit paintings are also arranged in terms of a coherent progression and also in relation to Vermeer's works. We're going to come back to that. And since these paintings, as we saw in examples from The Girl Interrupted, seem to be responding to works by Vermeer, combining elements of his compositions using the same models, interiors, and objects, the artist must have been his follower who had access, actually someone in his home, had access to those objects and rooms and so on. We know that Vermeer had no official students and he would have been required to register with the guild any official students. So the only possibility for a follower would have been one of his own children. That was a common practice. You didn't register your own children formally. And among his children, Maria Vermeer, that's why I had, was showing you this, which is that this is not only the family, but also uh, helps you to understand characters in this life of Vermeer's. Maria was 16 to 20 years old in the last years of his life, 1671, 75, which is when we're talking about the paintings that that follower is responding to are from the end of Vermeer's life. She's the most likely candidate. Less likely is the second daughter, Elizabeth, who we're going to talk about, who is 13 to 17 at that time and therefore less likely. So my two fundamental theses, that Vermeer's family served as his model and his paintings must be arranged in a logical and coherent order, stand on their own as an aspirational challenge to Vermeer's studies and art history generally. They are hypotheses offered in places where hypotheses are lacking. They are imperfect hypotheses and open to criticism and improvement. They also combine for a third hypothesis that Vermeer's daughter was a painter who made a fifth of the works currently assigned to him, the titular uh, theme of this conference. And all of this is obviously relevant for the girl interrupted, and which likewise present us with figures who in Lowell's words demand their living names, perhaps Maria is one, interrupted as Wren only recently suggested to me, not by us but by her father. And the painting also deserves to be placed in a sequence that reveals its own uh, development and aims, a different kind of accuracy, even a different kind of grace. But before we leave the museum, we should turn to that middle painting, the last one from the Vermeer wall, which was later displaced to the Great Hall. Mistress and Maid clearly also lacks a light-filled interior, which scholars have explained as unfinished, but folds of, brown, of a brown curtain behind are discernible. The composition also uncannily echoes Vermeer's much smaller girl writing a letter in Washington, D.C. You see here the yellow satin jacket with faux ermine trim, the rumpled blue tablecloth and objects on the table. I'm sorry. Except that Vermeer's uh, delicate and refined uh, uh, subtle treatment of details is replaced by a relatively crude exaggeration and surface plasticity with coarse, hard forms as evident in the glass inkwells here that look metallic. Here's a detail of the Frick painting. This is in Washington. A late painting by Vermeer, which gets increasingly dark and increasingly um, soft and pastel-like, and I guess more Chardin-like. Uh, 
The overly busy narrative of the maid receiving a letter while a mistress is uh, bringing a letter to the mistress who's still writing a letter seems to be a combination of elements from two of Vermeer's paintings. The love letter where she's being brought a letter by the maid and mistress writing with a maid where she's writing a letter. Uh, more specifically, in this case, the follower appears to have restaged a composition in the first example using the same objects but elaborated in terms of a second and third composition narrative structure and using different models. Now the story is getting a little complicated for the confines of the Frick. And at stake, I think, are two fundamentally different ways of looking at art as individual valuable and perhaps somewhat fetishized objects in isolation in museums and his works originating as part of the artist's creative process, his or her broader development, personal histories and experience. As we leave the gallery, we pass by the Polish rider, which reminds us that the problems of this nature are not limited to Vermeer, nor are they solely monetary in nature. As many of you probably know, the Rembrandt Research Project is a team of scholars, scholars seeking to reevaluate Rembrandt's herb infamously rejected the Polish writer back in 1984, and more recently they've claimed instead that it was largely completed by an unknown student. Uh, the subject has also never been identified. I've argued and I continue to make the case that Rembrandt and Rembrandt alone painted the composition at the height of his powers, and the writer is not Polish but rather Hebrew or Jewish. It's a naturalistic portrait of the young biblical David before Jerusalem based on a contemporary Jewish model, but uh, this is a topic outside the scope of this conference. But uh, let it be said not that I not only question the Frick's masterpieces, I also defend them, if need be, even against the museum itself. <laughs> <laughs> now, normally we would walk over to the Metropolitan Museum, which is often open later. You can grab a hot dog on the way. And it contains Vermeer's involving some of the same issues. But as it turns out, the Dutch galleries are closed right now. I think it's the only time I remember, except after 911, that you couldn't see a Rembrandt or Vermeer in the Met. So good thing that we're talking about them here. And I propose instead that we take the subway back down to the Cantor Film Center <laughs> and watch a film that I made to be shown in Florence at Ren's request. It's a, it's a rough film and one that reflects my former irritatingly dogmatic, uh, self-certain attitude towards my hypothesis. I hope you'll forgive me, but I do think, I hope that it presents the, some of the different threads of this broader argument in accessible form. Everyone loves Vermeer's paintings, with good reason. We can characterize his achievement in terms of essential qualities. Extraordinary subtlety of intense light caresses walls, objects, and faces, and eliminates linear contours. Brilliantly harmonized colors, also relative to light, turn a blue tablecloth partly yellow, for example. Astoundingly refined detail, combined with its occlusion or distortion at strategic points, evokes how we actually see. Restrained, convincingly naturalistic human psychologies are never acted or staged. Silence and stillness envelop an eternal world of pristine perfection. On the other hand, several misfit paintings currently included in Vermeer's oeuvre don't seem to belong. Compare these two paintings on a wall of the Metropolitan Museum in New York, or this even more striking contrast on a wall of the neighboring Frick collection, separated by a strategic carreau. Some of these compositions lack the essential qualities of Vermeer's paintings, subtle light, harmonious colors, refined detail, restrained psychologies, silence, and stillness. Earlier scholars noted problems with these works, but never addressed them as a group or in a systematic way, and sought to justify the problems in various unconvincing ways, as forgeries, unfinished, the result of poor condition, later overpainting, or a bad day. Only one idea made sense. These are paintings by an assistant or apprentice, or since Vermeer had no official students, one of his children, who he did not need to register. Yet scholars never seriously pursued this possibility, in part because no document refers to another Vermeer as a painter. I will explain the reasons for this absence of written documents, but in any case, these circumstances should not lead to neglect of the visual documents, which are the foundation of art history. People have not been looking carefully enough at the paintings. 
Indeed, the most important questions about Vermeer's paintings, the relation of form to content and his art to his life, still have to be answered. Also, no scholars place Vermeer's works in clear chronological order. Previous authors identified Vermeer's family members in some of his paintings, but recent scholars deny such connections as anachronistic and romantic. The Romantics invented art history, or writing about paintings in ways that could not be articulated in their own time, including issues like the relation of an artist's life and work. Théophile Touré, who discovered Vermeer as an unrecognized genius around 1860, called him the Sphinx of Delft because so little was known of him. He devoted the rest of his life to recovering facts about the artist's biography and his life work, although roughly half of these were mistaken. Today, Vermeer is still thought of as a mysterious figure, but we know a great deal about his life, including fascinating family secrets. Vermeer and his wife had 11 surviving children. A patron bought 20 of his works, and he ultimately died bankrupt at the relatively early age of 43. Yet scholars have never told us how his life illuminates his work, or indeed how his art illuminates his life. I propose that at least one family member appears in each of his paintings and informs their content, an idea he elaborated from Rembrandt. Vermeer also explicitly reflected in his paintings on the role of his family, which even determined the development of his career. Perhaps most importantly, his eldest daughter, model for the girl with the pearl earring, started painting for herself and created the misfit compositions, one-fifth of those now assigned to her father. She did not continue as a painter, as far as we know, but some of her works suggest she too could have been a great artist. Admittedly, the relation of art and life can be represented crudely or misrepresented, as in Irving Stone's biographical novels about Van Gogh and Michelangelo, Lust for Life and The Agony and the Ecstasy, later made into films. Tracy Chevalier's best-selling novel from 2000, The Girl with a Pearl Earring, made into a film of the same name, presents a similar case. She too made things up, in her case a maid's assistant, who ends up as Vermeer's love interest and secret model for his painting, Girl with a Pearl Earring. His jealous wife finds out about the painting, attacks it with a knife, and complains, Why don't you paint me? The film significantly undermines Chevalier's fiction by dressing Vermeer's wife as she appears in his painting, Woman in Blue. In truth, Vermeer painted his wife over and over more than any other model, beginning with his earliest compositions. He eventually exhausted every possible variation and grew tired of her, or she of him. His Girl with a Pearl Earring, a relatively late work, was based on his eldest daughter Maria, as earlier scholars recognized. Vermeer's Little Street, offers an ideal entry point to his art and life. One scholar declared the location of the little street has never been identified and the probability is slight that it ever will be. But the first and most obvious proposal was correct. Back in 1888, Van Gogh assumed Vermeer portrayed his own house and in tribute called his painting of his house in Arles, The Street, The Yellow House. Vermeer was born in 1632 and grew up in his father's tavern and art gallery on the north side of Delft's central market square. After his father's death left the family in debt, at the age of 21 he married a girl from a wealthy Catholic family and moved into her mother's house across and just beyond the main square. The neighborhood was dubbed the Papist Corner. Catholicism was illegal in the Dutch Republic, yet tolerated by local authorities when they were given money to do so. After the emancipation of the Dutch Catholics in 1837, the entire block was eventually replaced by a neo-Gothic Catholic church, the vestry of which now stands on the former site of Vermeer's home. The position of the house in maps corresponds to the house in Vermeer's painting, with its stately 16th century climbing crenellated gable, full of repairs and iron reinforcements, one of the few that survived the Great Fire of 1536. The one visible window and dimensions of the shutters correspond to windows in Vermeer's paintings which he based on the rooms in his house. The woman sewing in the threshold was therefore most logically his wife in a costume that appears in parts in his other paintings based on her. The little girl playing or drawing on the stoop must have been his eldest daughter Maria who was around 10 in 1664, the likely date of the painting, with a boy companion. The servant fetching water from a barrel in the alleyway would be the family maid, 
recognizable from her build and costume in other Vermeer paintings such as his Milkmaid. An open window of the upper story front room, which Vermeer uses his studio with its northern light, could have served to air it out during his absence. The little street embodies in visual form the connection of art and life later formulated in romantic texts, including Emile Zola's succinct definition of modern art, a corner of nature seen through a particular temperament. Modern art is genre painting. Its content is not a religious or allegorical message, but rather the artist's skill and idiosyncratic vision in relation to his environment. Vermeer began as a painter of historical scenes, yet his earliest compositions already use his wife as model and draw on his own circumstances. His Procurus of 1656 celebrates his turn to genre based on his family as models. His wife at the right plays a whore, her brother the client fondling her, their mother is dressed in a nun's habit as the female pimp or madam, assisted by her son-in-law Vermeer as musician, who offers a masturbatory toast to his adopted family, source of housing, money, models, and provocative ideas. As J. M. Montius only recently discovered, Vermeer's mother-in-law was estranged from her violent and abusive husband, a role taken over by her son in relation to his sister, Vermeer's wife. Vermeer apparently found their Catholicism and dysfunctional relations exotic and colorful, as his painting suggests. Yet his brother-in-law eventually became a problem, threatening to beat and tormenting Vermeer's wife when she was pregnant and had to be placed in a house of correction around 1665. Vermeer's following Girl at a Table portrays his wife in the aftermath of a raucous family altercation. Autoradiography is revealed he removed a man at the threshold, presumably her brother. His following Letter Reader shows her standing at the window of the upper story front room which he took over as his studio. Here he began to use a camera obscura, a forerunner of the modern camera with a pinhole through which light cast an image of the outside world, inaugurating his mature style. Subsequent works refine his strategy with his wife, the family maid, and other family members in multi-figure scenes. Each composition adds a new dimension or alteration, including full-length figures, floors, and windows. He reached a point of sublime complexity in his music lesson, after which he returned to single-figure paintings of his wife, pregnant as she often was at this time, a conscious repetition to suggest the cycle of creation and his rivalry with his wife as creator, coming full circle to his earliest mature composition, reliving his youth and early art. At this point, Vermeer's attention apparently wandered outside his studio window to the small merchant's house across the canal for a now lost or unrecognized painting. He then went over to this house to portray his own house in the little street and moved on to a small house just beyond the old town walls to paint his view of Delft. Vermeer's monumental city view, which likely took him a year or more to paint, was a wager with history to create a work of unsurpassable perfection and ambition. Torre discovered Vermeer through the painting, an episode Marcel Proust reworked in relation to his own last year of life in his novel In Search of Lost Time. Proust's fictional novelist Bergotte goes to see the view of Delft at a Paris exhibition, recalls a critic's reference to a little patch of yellow wall, and dies before the painting. The motif illustrates in Proust's words that genius consists in the power to reflect and not in the intrinsic value of the scene reflected. We can further unfold Proust's insight in relation to the scene's content. The dull red roofs at the left lie under heavy clouds. The salmon-colored ones in the center background are illuminated by light peeking through, and the little patch of yellow wall to the right is actually a red roof that reflects the direct light of the sun, heightened by its steep angle. Knotting together several of Proust's metaphors, the yellow wall could be said to illustrate the reflective power of genius, the light of Vermeer's sun, which still reaches us long after his death. Vermeer had nowhere to go but back home, yet upon his return, he renewed his art through his eldest daughter, Maria, who was now old enough to take her mother's place and serve as his model, or convinced him she was. He commemorated the moment in his girl with a pearl necklace. Here she plays her mother and her father's model, discovering her beauty as a young woman. Art and life are tied in an inextricable knot. 
she appears again in his Art of Painting. Scholars have misidentified her as Cleo, the muse of history writing, yet Vermeer was not a history painter. His own wife and mother-in-law referred to a female personification of painting, het schilderkunst, specifically Netherlandish painting. In opposition to the reigning ideal of Italianate historical or allegorical painting, Vermeer affirms genre painting as modern art, a love for the visible all around us, real people, concrete objects, and everyday settings. Both his evolving art and her maturing beauty reached their simultaneous apex in his Girl with a Pearl Earring. Several of Vermeer's late works include a heavy-set, round-faced, wall-eyed, matronly model based loosely on his mother-in-law, in two cases together with the family maid. Her newfound prominence in Vermeer's art presumably resulted from his increasing financial dependence on her and coincided with his artistic and physical decline. The allegory of Catholic faith has often been identified as Vermeer's worst painting or one mistake, with its overweight model, awkwardness, and religious symbolism alien to his art, doubling his beautiful art of painting as parody, although scholars have been at a loss to explain why. The obvious answer is, his mother-in-law commissioned a composition based on his art of painting, with herself as model, to proclaim her own Catholic agenda, and he could not refuse. Yet his artistry could not help but subvert her ideology from within. The heavy-handed symbolism and her own heavy self as model render the message ridiculous and even scandalous, above all in the glass sphere meant to evoke God and the universe contained by faith, which through its exacting naturalism reflects the Protestant new church across the street outside in the light of day. Vermeer's last remaining model, a homely and vaguely melancholic girl who's been recognized in his girl writing a letter, girl with a guitar, and lace maker, within one scholar's description, the same jutting out jaw, bulging forehead, and round, widely spaced eyes, not unlike Vermeer himself, must have been his second child, Elizabeth or Lesbeth. The first example heralded the darkness of his late paintings, whereas his brighter and peculiarly eccentric last two paintings pose a riddle of the conclusion of his career. We have come a long way in unfolding the core of Vermeer's visual thought since Torre's pioneering catalog. As in Torre's time, our accounts are profoundly influenced by reproductive technologies. The most recent exhibition on Vermeer's Milkmaid at the Metropolitan Museum, New York, included reproductions of what the curators identified as the 36 extant paintings by Vermeer, although not in chronological order or scale. People were fascinated by what was not there when the real things lay just around the corner, although these are often difficult to see, let alone compare. As a visual thought experiment, we can substitute better quality reproductions and scale that move around in our film. This strategy allows us to address the six misfit works normally included among Vermeer's paintings and a seventh only recently added to his oeuvre under dubious circumstances. Like most books, The Met's Grid placed Vermeer's Girl with a Pearl Earring near two related small head studies, Girl with a Flute and Girl with a Red Hat. Both portray the same girl with short dark brown hair and exotic hats of uncertain material, seated before invented tapestry backgrounds painted on recycled panels otherwise unknown in Vermeer. Their presentation is bold, spontaneous, experimental, and strikingly modern, with bizarre color juxtapositions, exaggerated light contrasts, and aggressive non-naturalistic camera obscura effects of blurs and distortions. The compositions also include uncanny mistakes in skewed chair finials, an impossible flute, a lace collar that was scraped away, and the peculiar construction of the hats. Scholars at different times have compared the two panels to self-portraits, citing the girls' positions, the way they gaze out at us, their hats, and other elements. All these dimensions are at odds with Vermeer's characteristically cautious, meticulous perfection. The panels have been explained as 19th century forgeries, as a result of overpainting by a later artist, or as possibly painted by one of Vermeer's children without pursuing the matter. Beginning painters often made self-portrait studies because they were always available as a model, and the brash, spontaneous, experimental approach of the panels, their technical difficulties and incongruities, and the recycling of a used panel are all in keeping with the young artist. 
The girls further resemble Maria in her father's paintings, most obviously in his girl with a pearl earring and her girl in a red hat, particularly when we allow for the reversal of her image in the mirror. All these examples exhibit almost invisible eyebrows above deep eye sockets, high cheekbones, slightly upturned noses, a pronounced philtrum or vertical groove beneath the nose, and thick lower lips. Maria presented herself more as a creative subject than a beautiful object, enshrouded in shadows, slightly older with darker hair, presumably 18 or 19 years old, around 1671 or 2, two years after his Girl with a Pearl Earring. Between the two panels and Vermeer's Girl with a Pearl Earring in the Metz grid, we find Portrait of a Woman. Scholars have noted her wide, flat face and mongoloid features and stunted or clumsy hand. The meringue-like folds of her light blue drapery bear no relation to a body. Scholars recognize the same model as in Vermeer's Girl Writing and Girl with a Guitar, Maria's younger sister, Lisbeth. Maria apparently sought to emulate her father's portrait study of her using her sister as model but she had difficulty harnessing the distorting effects of a camera obscura and constructing a three-dimensional body for a formal portrait. Mistress and Maid appears in the Metz grid on the opposite side of the girl with a pearl earring and has a similar brown background, which is at odds with Vermeer's light-filled interiors. The composition has been explained as unfinished, but in fact includes the folds of a brown curtain behind. Earlier scholars proposed the work was painted by an assistant and compared what Ren Weschler amusingly calls her lobster claw hand to the similarly stunted hand in Girl with a Flute. The composition also pieced together several elements from Vermeer's paintings. Following her father, she used her grandmother as model for the maid, whereas her aging mother served as mistress, dressed in an elaborate hairdo and jewelry, a red cord dangling from her maternity dress. Despite her technical limitations, Maria's composition is vigorous, engaging, and amusing, and now hangs alongside other masterpieces of Western art in Henry Clay Frick's Great Hall as his last and proudest purchase. Another painting in the Frick assigned to Vermeer, Girl Interrupted at Her Music, is found in the Metz grid beside two of his similar interior scenes which share many compositional elements but these elements are pieced together in Girl Interrupted in the pastiche-like manner of Maria's mistress and maid, with a similar narrative of one bust-length figure seated at a table, interrupted by another from behind. Some propose that Vermeer lost his courage or was not able to get it right. Others invoked poor condition, but that would not explain the absence of a perspective scheme or the dark, distorted painting of Cupid, which was based on the pristine version in Vermeer's Lady Standing at a Virginal, painted around the same time. Her head is tiny, yet in appearance and attitude, the girl interrupted by a male companion recalls Maria's self-portrait studies. Her situation also corresponds to Maria Vermeer's, who had to give up painting after she got married the following year. A sixth misfit, woman with a lute, is located in the Metz grid beside Vermeer's Woman with a Pitcher and has a similar composition, but lacks its clarity of definition in space and light. Here too, diverse elements were drawn from Vermeer's paintings, but combined more synthetically. The musical theme and overall setting appear to be elaborated from Maria's Girl Interrupted. Scholars recognize the same model in Portrait of a Young Woman. Lisbeth's gaze out the window suggests an eagerness to be interrupted as well. The map of Europe evokes the more global outlook of a younger generation. As it turned out, most of Maria's paintings ended up in what was then New Amsterdam, only just lost to the British. Two of Maria's paintings are now found on what I like to call the Baker's Wall of the Metropolitan Museum, because two paintings owned by Vermeer's Baker, which he assumed were both by Vermeer, also hang there. Vermeer died in 1675 in debt and owed the most money to the Baker. He had already traded his woman with a pitcher, which his patron did not want, against a prior debt to the baker for bread, and he continued this strategy for feeding his family up to his death. But his patron bought his last paintings. His wife nevertheless settled the baker's debt with two paintings described in a document as two persons, one of whom is sitting and writing a letter, and the other with a person playing a cittern, a round-bottomed, lute-like instrument. In other words, she paid the debt with her daughter's paintings, Mistress and Maid and Woman with a Lute. 
This deception would only be possible if no one outside the family knew that Maria was Vermeer's apprentice. Their decision had to be made early on, with Vermeer's tacit approval or active collusion. Maria's woman with a lute even consciously emulated her father's woman with a pitcher, then in the baker's possession, to underscore their connection. Given the family's debts, Vermeer's declining health, Maria's precocious abilities, and their predisposition as hidden Catholics, there were plenty of reasons to keep her late apprenticeship a family secret. The seventh misfit at the end of the Met's grid, young woman seated at a virginal, was included in early monographs but later rejected as the work of a pupil and a pastiche of Vermeer's lady standing at a virginal and lady seated at a virginal. In one scholar's harsh words, a tasteless mishmash with arms like pig's trotters. Technical examination in 2004 revealed that the canvas was cut from the same bolt as Vermeer's lace maker of the same dimensions. A team of scholars convened by Sotheby's for this purpose affirmed the composition as an undisputed Vermeer and rejected earlier speculations about an assistant. They claimed that it has been agreed since the earliest days of Vermeer's scholarship that he had no such apprentice or pupils. Not only is there no documentary record, but there is also no body of surviving work. Sotheby sold the painting for $30 million to Steve Wynn, who later resold it after the explanation offered here was first published. In truth, the possibility of an assistant has been raised repeatedly since the earliest days. There is no documentary record of Vermeer's apprentice because painters did not register their own children and her activity was a family secret. Her surviving body of work, discussed here, presents the closest analogies for the painting's simple costume with exaggerated surface folds, flat forms, and non-naturalistic camera obscura effects. The figure's bust-length profile pose, truncated hands, and deadpan expression are likewise characteristic of the other misfit paintings. Leaving aside dubious financial motives, the error betrays a failure to look carefully at and understand Vermeer's paintings. The same problem is evident in the Metz grid. Scholars have not identified Vermeer's models or recognized the underlying relation of his life to his work which makes it impossible to place his paintings in chronological order, separate out the misfit paintings, or understand their dependence on his example. At stake are two separate herbs and two separate lives, which mutually influenced each other. Maria had grown up watching her father paint, surrounded by his works, became his model early on, and likely served as his studio assistant, preparing paints and canvases. She understandably wanted to try her hand at painting and apparently inherited her father's talent. Her relatively late age can be explained insofar as Vermeer did not foresee her as his apprentice and perhaps thought to wait for his eldest son, who was still only eight in 1672. She seized the initiatives with her informal self-portrait studies and her more formal portrait of her sister. Mistress and Maid was her largest composition, followed by the more ambitious but seemingly cruder Girl Interrupted, in which she already registered the conflicting pressures of a young artist. By the time of her woman with a lute, she was an active forger, serving her family, and also appears to have provoked her father's response in his girl with a guitar, helping him out of the slump of his late paintings produced under the influence of her grandmother and his mother-in-law. The matching dimensions of Vermeer's lace maker and Maria's young woman seated at a virginal suggest an explicit competition between master and apprentice, father and daughter, at the end of his life. It was presumably her idea, since she worked on a small scale and likely prepared their canvases. Vermeer responded by adapting her bold and spontaneous effects to a naturalistic purpose, dribbling red and white paint to suggest dangling threads twisting and turning in space, a composition of classic simplicity, and a final concentrated tour de force. She sought to create a Vermeer-like interior in a tiny field and executed her composition with remarkable precision, but thereby magnified her technical limitations. She too included minuscule threads of matching red ribbons and white strands of pearls in Lisbeth's hair, but these lie unconvincingly flat on the surface. The short course of Maria's apprenticeship served to sacrifice her initial bold originality for the purpose of assimilating her father's technical achievement. 
Had she pursued her vision, she may well have become a great artist. Alas, like most women painters from this period, who likewise learned from their fathers in unrecorded apprenticeships, Maria must have given up painting when she married in May 1674. Her decision not to pursue her art was likely influenced by the family's debts and the deception they had perpetrated as a result, as well as her father's declining health and death in December 1675. Maria's Girl in a Red Hat remains one of the most fascinating works of Western art, its feathery red glow calling out to us, like the little patch of yellow wall, the light of her moon orbiting around his sun. Touré's discovery of Vermeer as an unrecognized genius took over a half a century to be accepted by the art historical establishment, and a similar term may be required for acceptance of my own modest discovery of Maria Vermeer as a painter. For her sake and his, I appeal to you. It seems to me that, at very least, there's something to talk about here. Uh, and it is striking that... No, we're not going to do that necessarily. Yeah. It is striking that we that how long it's taken for the conversation to get going. But let me just uh, one thing you might do, uh, Ben, is show. Can you put up the the two last paintings again, the side by side, so we can just talk about that a little bit clearer. Um, so just bring out because that was a little bit confusing. I think one of your nicer points is is the thing about the red. Uh, talk about that a little bit. The uh, that he, as I said, he's working on her level. Of Scott size, so there's a way that they're returning. They're right here. Here they are. <laughs> there they are on the, the the size, and I wanted to show you the two little self portraits, which are hidden behind here. So you can see there's a strange way that in the, at the end of her little career of what we have of a few years, they came back for one final one where he they were working on small canvases that are like her little studies. And that's part of her genius. I think she was doing something very interesting that he seems to have been responding to. At the same time, she, her whole career had been about technically mastering his techniques so that it came to the possibility that she could do this, which is her most accomplished in terms of some things, perspective scheme, the light of the back wall. But in some ways, it's disappointing because it seems like she's subordinated all of her interesting, vivid precocity and her own originality in trying to emulate him. And one of the ways that you see this is he's done this beautiful thing of dripping paint, and you can, scholars have talked about this, you can see that he's literally been dribbling it from the paintbrush, thick paint in the manner of Pollock, but in order to suggest threads coming out of this uh, little sewing cushion. But you can see that even though it's dripped paint, he absolutely masters little threads coming down in three-dimensional twisting and turning over the table. It's an incredible performance. What she did was did something similar in these little red ribbons in the hair and little, supposed to be white, they're supposed to be pearl, little teeny pearl necklaces. But it too is on the surface of the canvas, but because she's trying to make ribbons, it actually looks characteristically flat. That the, in this little uh, play and trying to imitate uh, or, or measure up on this kind of incredible close reading or close painting, close, close painting, uh, you see that one of the characteristic problems she has is she doesn't master depth on the level that he does. Uh, and it's almost like a metaphor because he's learned from her this incredible freedom that he could dribble and do something really experimental, which is kind of beyond the normal Vermeer, whereas she subordinated herself to trying to make this decorative ribbons that, it, that then betray their flatness. And you could see the same thing is going on. We could talk about this with the hands that there's this strange way that these hands she wasn't able to master are kind of hidden in the piano and they're not very convincing, whereas he's doing the, they're bo presumably both the younger sister, second youngest, uh, Lisbeth, both were models, but you see how Lisbeth in Vermeer's painting is doing this incredibly careful uh, work with her fingers that suggests the articulateness and eloquence of the hands, Vermeer's painting of hands and her hands, and she's also making her own little visual uh, kind of sewing, a, a close painting, um, sewing. It's kind of a Chuck Close type of metaphor for painting. Um, OK. 
Can you show, it. actually, I'm just giving my little two yes. cents is that I'm convinced that the v, show where the VM is in, in, the, in his. This is, this is uh, there's, a, there's a kind of M here in the collar and there's a V in the little threads. No, I actually see the M in the hands. The, the well, hands, it could yeah, be also yeah, again yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but this is, one of the things that when, they, when the Sotheby's people decided this was definitely going to be something that they could sell for $30 million, one of the, their major points was, and this seemed to be the deal clincher, was that they were able to prove that the, the bolt of cloth that it was done on was exactly the same bolt. It has the same the same, what is it? Thread called? count the thread and weft count and, and so weave. Forth. So that sealed it. This had to be a Vermeer, but of course this is an alternate thing. It could have just been the two of them working together. Can you show the uh, Elizabeth uh, with the, the, the hand one? The, the hands, the comparison of hands? Well, the, 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 uh, this one, the Trani. Just, just show All right. it on the screen. Uh, yeah, I mentioned this because uh, I was with Walter Liedtke at the, uh, in the closed uh, Dutch uh, rooms at the, at the Met. It, they will open in a few weeks or a few months. And they are quite beautiful, by the way. Uh, but he, I, I just want to compare how the two of you talk about this. He makes an argument, this is Vermeer. He says, no doubt it's Vermeer. It's obviously Vermeer. And the single most brilliant thing in it is the wrist at the bottom, he says. And he goes on to say that this was only a genius could come up with this idea of putting a wrist down there and that that, in turn, if you put your hand over it, you can do this experiment yourself, that it's very, very flat. But the minute the wrist is there, it's as if the wrist is on the, on the, uh, uh, well, that's yeah. <laughs> Where, where'd you go? Uh, anyway, you can see, you can, uh, he, he argues that the wrist is what gives the whole thing a three-dimensionality and it pops everything forward and so forth. Whereas you have an, uh, another reading for the hand, which is what? Well, uh, I was suggesting that there's problems in Maria Vermeer's hands. I, I have a, just, uh, I prepared a, uh, a little comparison. That's actually slide, uh, slide, I spend more time on the slide than any slide I've ever made. Uh, not this one, with Maria's hands. Those are all of Maria Vermeer paintings, or the ones that I attribute to her. And you can see this strange thing about, that's not so bad, the frick, but she's not, they tend to be blocked out or hidden. They have certain kind of animal-like qualities. People are invoking pigs. Yeah, one in the upper left-hand corner, which is that? That's from what? That's, that's the, Liedke's hand, the one he really likes. No, no, the, the other corner. Yeah. That's uh, the girl with the flute. That is that's one the girl with the red hat. <laughs> Something, yeah. the the nail looks a little bit funny too, but I just thought this was the slide that I spent so long, and not that long, but it took a long time, a lot of hands on that slide. But you can see that in, in Vermeer, hands are often incredibly uh, delicate and articulate and always doing all kinds of things, and uh, it seems a natural association for the, the, the painter who's accomplished. Uh, I would say to Walter Liedke's uh, claim, that, uh, I mean, first of all, looking at Berenson, I mean, the reciprocal relations, it's, it's important to compare. So there is something about the comparison of here and here. He may be right that this serves an important purpose. I would ask him, and he says this is the essence of its genius. Does he feel that way about the head, the distorted One head? One of the things or? he then says is that you should all, he, what does he call the second law of connoisseurship? that you should always judge a painting by its best passages and not its worst passages. Did, did he tell you where he got that? No, no, don't, we're not gonna be nice. No, no, I was wondering. <laughs> you know, I'd love to know. By the I, way, I have been training this guy for, for No, you a said year. you were gonna ask him. Nice. What? You said you were gonna ask him, Ren. Uh, I, I and forgot, I'd love I, to I, know. I, I forgot to ask him that. I but, think but, it's an important principle. I don't, I'm not exactly sure what he means by it, but I actually think in this case, he says you've got to base it by the strongest passages, and he, then he says the hand is the strongest passage. But first of all, most Vermeer scholars actually have problems with that hand. Yeah. And I would say the strongest things in Maria Vermeer are actually things about she has more empathy, it seems, for her subjects. And there's ways that this. So if we're talking about, I love this painting very much. Uh, I think it's very, very interesting, and it has strong things, but I don't think what it's strong on is things like mastery of the hand or of the three-dimensional head. I think there's a lot of human sympathy for the, for the girl. I think it's a, it's a beautiful painting by any uh, measure. It's quite intriguing, and it's beautifully done. 
I just don't think it is characteristic of Vermeer's paintings. And it's interesting about principles of connoisseurship, because I would have said the first one was Berenson's, that it's the reciprocal relations in order uh, established by comparison. So is this the same painter? Or are they two different sensibilities? And um, a second principle of connoisseurship, I would actually say, is it's not enough to just uh, do it yourself. There's, good, there's better connoisseurs. In other words, we value Berenson because people have, Rachel will tell us about this. I mean, people accuse him of all kinds of things, and there were some shady dealings, no doubt. But I think that Berenson's judgments have, in the long run, really held up very strongly. He was a brilliant man who made lots of lists of things that were compelling and sorted things out. So, but I would, just to invoke the name of another, for me, great, greatest scholar of our history, greatest, one of the great connoisseurs, N not a professional kind of sir, but Leo Steinberg is a hero of mine. He's no longer with us, but uh, I saw the sh Vermeer show with him, and we were sitting on the steps after, and I was evolving this theory at that time. And we were sitting there, and he looked across the street because that, that was on a banner for the invert. He said, I never liked her ugly mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, oh my god, that's one of the paintings too. That's, that's literally the way this thing went, which is I was in there looking at something else, and, and uh, the Sotheby's painting was in there. Some of them are more obvious, but uh, that's certainly what we're talking about here, which is what is connoisseurship, who is saying what. Uh, um, I think it's an interesting observation about the hand, but also Walter Liebke hasn't published that. Mm -hmm. He's not making that argument. So that's partly what we're talking about, is what is it that people do say in Vermeer's scholarship and why? Can you go, uh, we were also going to talk about self-portraits. Can you show us again, side by side, the, the red hat and the, uh, the girl with the pearl? Which I would argue, by the way, are two spectacular paintings, no matter what, what, what we're saying. A few things. Uh, I mean, this is also on your on the front of your brochures, yeah, so right. you have it right there. Right. Um, talk about the difference between a portrait and a self-portrait in terms of what a port what they look like. Well, I actually had um, there's this. I had uh, another. Um, I'm going to put this one away because it's not relevant. I had prepared an, uh, another little slide. It's not easy to find these. This is it. I'm just going to show you. Because I th I, I've been thinking a lot about this. I'm, do I'm lucky enough to be able to teach a class on self -port the history of self-portraiture this fall at Cooper Union. I'm really excited about it. And I wanted to invoke, you know, when you get uh, you apply to Cooper, you have to make them two different kinds of self-portrait. One is using yourself physically, and one is not using yourself. Because everybody knows that an artist also expresses themselves when they paint whatever it is. So we have this interesting thing that theoretically all paintings are self-portraits if they really express the artist. These are Chuck Close, there's a Jerry Davis painting, this is a Vince Desiderio painting, and an April Gornick painting. I think we all see that. We also see that there's something special about the artist depicting themselves that we recognize it. And one of the proofs of that is the idea that you can recognize a self-portrait when it's not been recognized. So that's one of the things that's at stake in people before me saying the girl with the red hat was a self-portrait. And I think this has to do with also some things that we rehearsed in the film, which is, um, what is a self-portrait that relates to the question of what is genre painting and what is modern art? There was this idea from Proust that it's about the reflection, not the thing reflected. So it's not literally that it shows you the artist's face, and we know that's Maria Vermeer, like we know that's Chuck Close, and we, the point of the painting is to show us what Chuck Close looks like. The point of the painting is to show us how Chuck Close thinks, how Chuck Close paints. But there's something very special about his using his own face to do that. So, and I, I'm saying this is a genuine mystery for me, these two things. Well, on the one hand, we can't simply erase the importance of self-portraiture because all painting really is self-portraiture, and especially because there's the idea that 
can we recognize it? And we do recognize Chuck Close's portraits. And I was suggesting that there's some Vermeer's uh, unrecognized self-portraits. And it's important for us to know it, that all of these things somehow are in play about uh, the relationship between the inner sensibility of the artist, how they paint, with their external circumstances, who they are, a white male or teenage girl, or mm -hmm. uh, what their circumstances are. And I I'm should not, say, by the way, one yeah. of the things Walter said was, are we to believe that a teenage girl was able to make that picture? Yeah. You'd be amazed at what uh, teenage girls can do. <laughs> behave yourself, behave yourself. <laughs> I'm sorry? Um, no. I'd like to see a teenage girl do that. This red hat? Two wonderful daughters, but Chuck, yeah, well, well, but so so I so but but in all seriousness, that is going to be a uh, a serious criticism that that your theory has to deal with, which is the youth of the the the, the prodigious uh, talent that is being portrayed by this by this person. And what's interesting here is the polemic goes against me from both sides, as it should, which is these misfit paintings. There's a lot of criticism of them. That's part of the problem. That's what we're trying to address. Why are they so disparate from Vermeer? Which seems to me to fit in with it being a young painter. I don't really know about what to think about gender. I think it's a very important category. Uh, and I think we're going to be talking about this. Uh, Linda Nochlin is not going to be coming. Yeah. But she, of course, famously wrote this essay about why are there no women artists and part of the responding to Virginia Woolf, who was talking about Shakespeare's sister. I mean, part of the assertion is the circumstances, the economic and social circumstances which artists produce limits women and young women. Because we know there's some brilliant young men, boy painters, Durer, 13-year-olds we've seen do incredible things. Uh, and this is somehow part of the mystery, or part of what we're looking at, that um, the implausibility or the, 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 the weight of the evidence or you know, the problems with what I'm proposing, which comes from both ways. Oh, those are too good for a young girl, or those are not good enough for Vermeer. But it's also bound up in historical circumstances, which is I don't see why someone with Vermeer's DNA couldn't have been as good a painter as him if with time, or maybe better, depending on what she got from the mother. But, uh, one of the things that we're talking about here is the reason why we're the reason why this hasn't come up presumably is because of these circumstances, these economic and social circumstances. Which in Maria's Vermeer's uh, case, if I'm correct about the baker and what the family pressures were, were particularly enormous. Not just that she didn't have a room of her own; she didn't even get to paint her own paintings for herself. She was already trying to dig the family out from their debts when she was a young woman. Uh, yeah. and, and, and this goes both ways, that people will say, apparently, Liedtke said, well, it's very convenient for him that it was a family secret. Well, but we're also trying to account for these circumstances. Mm -hmm. Let's, um, the, uh, uh, there's a few points I want to make, but one of them is you, you wrote up Shakespeare's sister. And, and so I suppose one kind of criticism that one can make here is, you know, uh, are we in the terrain here of all of Shakespeare was done by an albino uh, transvestite? You know those kinds of theories. You know that uh, <laughs> that that uh, uh, or all of Shakespeare was done by Francis Bacon, or all of Shakespeare was done by Shakespeare's sister. Or you know, I mean, there are various kinds of theories that go that way. Uh, Earl of Oxford, the Earl of Oxford, that kind of thing. And so, uh, in that context, uh, there's a nice. I was going to put these quotes on this. You'll just have to hear them. Does, don't, don't bother. We're not going to put them on the screen. But uh, the, uh, there was a quote that I'll read to you, and then we'll figure out who it is who says it. Creative ideas are often attacked because people oppose change or do not understand new concepts. When a prominent discovery is revealed, particularly if it provides an obvious and simple answer to an important question, experts who have worked for years unsuccessfully on the same problem lash out at the creator and the idea because they themselves did not find the solution. Creativ creativity requires courage. Now, the cool thing about that quote is that it's from uh, Dr. Henry Heimlich, the guy who made the Heimlich maneuver, <laughs> except that it's from him in his later years, in his cranky years, when in this particular case, this quote is about his theory that malaria would be a cure for AIDS. 
<laughs> so, I mean, you know, in other words, you can have elaborate uh, theories and, and, and so forth that, that, uh, that, you know, are wonderfully renegade and wonderfully insurgent and so forth, and there's a romance to the insurgency, but, but they don't necessarily, are necessarily right. And, and, and I think we have that feeling, we have that problem with some of the Shakespeare, you know. And, and, and by the way, one of the things that's fascinating about that is that the people who do these things spend years and years, as you have, coming up with all kinds of things that seem to make it seem right. And so, I mean, there's an epistemological problem here. If you keep on looking, you'll find stuff. I'm not, I'm not uh, epistemology is very important. Yeah. I, 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 there's a couple things to say about Shakespeare, a very important example, which takes us outside the realm of art history proper. I would say first that the bracketing off uh, whatever uh, the albino transvestite theory I'm not familiar with and the, uh, <laughs> uh, but I know about the, the Earl of Oxford and the Francis Bacon theories. And I actually would put that opposite Shakespeare scholars like Stephen Greenblatt, I know, uh, was a teacher of mine at Berkeley, and they do close uh, readings, philological readings of some of the late plays, Henry VIII or Cymbeline. It seems that late Shakespeare uh, either didn't, was getting tired or for various reasons had some collaborator that were doing certain sections that you could see had different meter and so on, which is relevant because that's what we're talking about, the late uh, Vermeer also, that he has his own, there's a strangeness to Lake Shakespeare, there's a strangeness to late Vermeer, but those theories are based on actually very, very close readings and trying to structurally explain everything that we know in terms of biography. And whereas the Earl of Oxford and the Francis Bacon are based on a kind of emotional, uh, irrational incapacity. If I understand correctly, the gist of it was that it had to be a, a, a nobleman or someone who went to college mm -hmm. uh, that they wouldn't accept the fact, which is, does, doesn't really make sense because Shakespeare uh, did an internship at a law, legal office, where he got a little vocabulary, something like that. But, but it's relevant in the sense that, uh, and I mean, Shakespeare himself wanted to have a coat of arms, non sans droit, not without mustard, as Ben Johnson said. But I would say that the irrational uh, not wanting Shakespeare to be a middle class is actually comparable to the current consensus about Vermeer, that there's an emotional investment in not looking too carefully at these misfit paintings or putting them in order. Um, that might not be right, but I'm saying you have to look carefully to see on, the, on, a, on two sides of an issue which one is the empiricist. I also think, you know, nobody's calling into question Hamlet, I hope. I mean, that, the Earl of Oxford people are, not the Stephen Greenblatt people. And uh, here we know that the soldier and laughing girl is by Vermeer. Nobody's calling a question. We're talking about these problems, which themselves present problems. It's not a theory that I came up with because I, I'm a f uh, purely a feminist. I mean, I'm quasi-feminist, but uh, I, or to get myself attention, I actually feel like I'm trying to address problems: the family in Vermeer, the order of his paintings, these disparate works which has a lot to do with illuminating Vermeer better, understanding him in the, in the mode of the green blood. I would also say, on the other hand, you want to make a distinction between, for example, plays and paintings. That late plays where you're working hard and you have a scene done by somebody versus individual paintings or small paintings. <coughs> or in the case of Rembrandt, uh, that Polish writer we saw. And then I would, then I would say, I think art history is behind literary criticism, or certainly Shakespeare scholarship, where they've been over a lot of stuff, and Stephen Greenblatt has things to say, but he's doing, he's kind of polishing the diamond there of everything we know about Shakespeare, whereas I'm saying there's some pretty fundamental work to be done on Vermeer and Rembrandt servers, it seems to me, just by way of prefacing my being an, an eccentric, uh, we, we need to look more carefully at eccentric exurgency, uh, insurgencies in the case of the, the paintings maybe than the plays. Um, the, uh, another uh, point, by the way, this is, I, I was just reading uh, the, our, our, uh, the late uh, Thomas McEvely's uh, book, Art and Otherness, and he at one point, is, this was during his critique of the Big MoMA show, the Primitivism show, but he was, he was saying he invoked the principle of economy, quote, on which all science is based, that the explanatory principles are to be kept to the smallest possible number 
The principle of economy does not, of course, mean keeping information to a minimum, but keeping to a minimum the number of interpretive ideas that one brings to bear on information. The point is that unnecessary principles will usually reflect the wishful thinking of the speaker and amount to deceptive persuasive mechanisms. Um, in this context, uh, Marriott Westerman, who I spoke with, was saying, I agree with Ben about everything, but why does he need the woman? I agree that those seven or eight paintings are a problem. Why can't he just stop there? Why does he have to then go on I and wish, have this elaborate theory about I the wish Mariette would have published that. <laughs> well, he might <laughs> use the single voice of affirmation, but uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's, now, it's now out there. We all heard Mariette, uh, and uh, that's good. That's, that's halfway there. Uh, I think that if, you, if you, you, we could stop it short. I don't think that we need to stop short because it makes people uncomfortable. I think you have to present the, as best you can. So on the one hand, I try to be simple. Family in the paintings, put them in order, put those together, and you get a self-portrait. Uh, on the other hand, it gets kind of complicated at the end there with the recognizing Lisbeth, her face changes, Maria's painting technique changes, they're influencing each other, has to do with outside things that are happening in the family, the relation among these paintings, there's some things we could talk about, the patron, who owned what. But all of that should come back to, I would say, along with Occam's razor, we should have a different kind of like Occam's shaving cream or something about <laughs> having all of the stuff there, the cards on the table. I think we should be talking about what's going on, which is these paintings. And also, for me, I'm fascinated by the word oeuvre, which is a strange, one of these things. Art history borrows a name from French, oeuvre, which should remind you of those funny old catalogs. But it also means something very specific. It means a life work. But our life work is all of the stuff that we do. We got borrowed a suit from somebody, or, you know. Whereas oeuvre means a kind of catalog that was made by somebody in the 19th century. There's one after another. But that can change. So it both has to do with physical representation of something like oeuvre, but also what is an oeuvre? It's something that we kind of belatedly made up and continue to tinker with a life work. This reminds me, by the way, of uh, I was going to invoke this at the end of the thing, but I'll invoke it now. My, my, one of my favorite people in the world is, uh, is Auden in the late autumn, Auden, speaking of uh, morning prayers. And uh, he, ha he has a poem called Archaeology, which I'll just read the beginning of. Um, this is one of his last poems. The archaeologist's spade delves into dwellings vacancied long ago, unearthing evidence of life ways no one would dream of leading now, concerning which he has not much to say that he can prove the lucky man. <laughs> Knowledge may have its purposes, but guessing is always more fun than knowing. There is a profound sense in which we're never going to know. Uh, and that, that uh, and, and there's something wonderful about that, by the way. Uh, but it seems to me, and here, here I, I actually would uh, come to your defense. If, let's look at the, uh, the other uh, frick, the, the muddy frick, the green frick. Girl know. interrupted. Girl interrupted. If it, it, the thing, if you're not going to put, if you're not going to use a theory like yours and say that it wasn't done by Vermeer, you then have to put it somewhere. And, uh, and, and I think it's similar with a lot of these pictures, especially of, Elis uh, of, Elis uh, of Lisbeth, um, um, not so much th this one, but, but, but some of these things. If you're going to put them on the basis that he wasn't yet at his peak or that he was you know, something like that, generally the places that they put that one in particular is they put it way, way up front. Um, similarly with the Lisbeth, for example, when they do uh, 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 the point is that, I guess what I'm trying to say, I'm, I'm not being very articulate. The point is that, that if it is true that these are portraying some family members, and if you can, or at least they're portraying the same model, whether or not they're family members, they're showing up at all kinds of crazy places. Oh, actually, that's even better, the, the, the loot up there. This is based on yeah. the Walter Liebke when he put them in order, which is not in the catalog for the Milkmaid Show, and it's in no Vermeer books. No other books besides mine put all the paintings together, but they did do, that Milkmaid show was actually after my book, and then they put these up there, but it wasn't in scale. 
but here they are in the order that so, they... So this in particular, I guess I, I meant to talk about this one here. Um, but the point is, if that is in fact the same model as that and, and you know, so forth and so on, and if you put it here because of the relatively, it's not that good a picture, but it's kind of good, but, and parenthetically, it's the, it's the most Vermeer-like of the ones that you call Maria's. Uh, but you would have to put it fairly early for various reasons in terms of their logics, but then it doesn't make any sense because it's the same person who's down here at the same age, basically, and, and so you, you get into some of those. And it can't be given to the baker, which was one point in the film. You understand the talk, baker talk about, talk, Do talk about for a second about the, two, the Dysseus and the baker. What, are, what is that? Uh, well, we know that um, we actually have a lot of information about Vermeer. Uh, and one of the things that we know is uh, here is my, f um, let me go back one, this page here. And we actually have this different ways. But uh, this is from my book, and this is the new one that I'm making where everybody can participate, and we'll move it around. But, uh, and one of the things you could do is strip them off. In other words, what I'm saying is, we can look at this, Dysseus didn't own this. Well, he, explain who Dysseus is. And I'm who, sorry, that okay. Yo Johannes von Rauven is the man who was, Vermeer had a kind of patron. He lent him money, he gave him a, a yearly stipend in order to pick, have first pick of his works. And, here I'm showing you, these are the Dysseus works. And that, why, that, is it, why is it called Dysseus? Dysseus is his son-in-law. The patron son-in-law. Who There was a, a list made up where they describe them. And the list mostly corresponds, you know, a woman pouring out milk or a girl who's sewing. We know the greatest paintings are, it seems, the, the ones that are in the most famous um, museums in, in, in national collections of Europe, which were the earliest ones formed, are on this list. Uh, 20 paintings for Van Rauven, Vermeer's painting, paint, uh, patrons. Strangely, there's 21 on the Dysseus list of his son-in-law. And that's a mystery right there of Vermeer scholarship. Why was there one more painting that wasn't seen before? Montius suggests, well, maybe they missed the little street, which doesn't really make sense. Why would they have missed one of his paintings? My explanation is this is what Van Rauven, that the, the, the 21st Dysseus was of a Marie Vermeer painting. More specifically, Van Rauven bought this painting knowing it wasn't by Vermeer, but enjoyed it the same way Walter Lietke enjoys it, and knew Maria was a model for the paintings that she was in. But this, by the time that someone made up the list after his son-in-law died, they no longer knew the difference, so they called it 21 Vermeer paintings. And there is a painting that corresponds to this, a ditto of the, the head study. It's a little bit um, esoteric, but I also think it's very important to understand because you can do the inverse. And you could say, these are not the Dysseus paintings. These are the paintings that the Vermeer's patron didn't buy. Obviously, a bunch of early history paintings probably from before he knew him. He gets to know him around there. There's that wonderful painting, Letter Reader in Dresden, which Wren said, oh, I love that. I would have wanted that, but it's possible that Vermeer held back for various emotional reasons some of his own paintings occasionally. This one, the painter didn't want it, it ended up going to the baker. This Wait, one, I... Let's slow down. Who's to, the baker? There was a baker in the town, Hendrik van Bouten, that what Vermeer did was he first ran up a bunch of big debt for bread. He was feeding his family. In, in How Dutch, many in his family? Feeding... How many in his family? Eleven children. Hungry kids. And, uh, uh, well, you know, in Dutch they call it a broodschever, someone who writes for a living. And you, this is like a broodschilder, a painter who paints for bread. And uh, it was also, I think, something going on here that people have noted. It was noted by a French traveler, Mr. Moncoyne, I think his name is, who said, I saw a painting and uh, I, th I can't remember the amount, but he said, I think it's 10 times too much. I, Vermeer had no paintings to show me. They sent me to the baker, and I saw this one painting there, but it seemed to me it was he paid 10 times too much for it. And it's possible, people argue about, was, did he get it right? Was the baker lying? It's possible the baker paid an enormous amount of money for a painting, because normally you couldn't get a Vermeer painting. People knew him, and the baker knew the family, knew, but all the paintings were going to the patrons. So the baker was happy to get that painting. Vermeer, obviously happy to sell an occasional painting for 10 times what it was worth. 
And there was, may have been a thing where there was about bread, that the baker had plenty of bread, so he let Vermeer run up the bill. This is some speculation, but it's about accommodating the evidence. But this was already fairly early on that this happened. The bill that Vermeer left for the baker, 700 guilders, was incredible. That's like uh, you know, many times over a year's salary. Huge debt, and the baker was the first person in the line to get money from the Vermeer estate. So the, the wife traded him two paintings. And, and, and the, it was funny, there's even an addendum. This is a quote from a legal document that yes. Montius found? The two paintings by the aforementioned Vermeer who's dead, one representing two persons, one of whom is sitting and writing a letter, and the other with a person playing a sittern, a satyr. Sittern is something in between a guitar. It's a little bit like those Greek instruments, uh, uh, like a balalaika, in between a lute and a guitar. But it's, uh, it's when the one that she's playing the, in, the, in the music lesson. The funny thing is, this is what uh, Vermeer scholars, with the exception of Manius, who says there's another possibility, they all say that these are the paintings that the baker got, which is strange because it's called a woman with a, with a cittern, and they're giving him the girl with a guitar, when we know that the, paint, the, ba the patron had a painting called Girl with a Guitar. So why are they saying that a guitar is a lute and a cittern is a guitar? So what, what do you think? Are because the they're saying these are late paintings, and they assume mm -hmm. that the baker got the last paintings as Vermeer died. But the patron got Vermeer's last paintings. The patron who was alive and died around the same time as Vermeer got his last paintings, the lace maker. I say they're these two paintings: woman sitting writing a letter with another, and a woman playing a satyr, which is you can mix up a lute and a cittern pretty easily. Uh, the people who describe these paintings had them in front of them. But the Vermeer scholars don't want to see that because they think these are middle period works. But they're not really middle period works. They look vaguely middle period because they're kind of blurry. But in fact, if you look at Vermeer's middle period, there's nothing corresponding to this. And I've suggested they're late works that are pastiche. But this would be the, the theory that these were traded to the baker after Vermeer's death. Let, let me, by the way, just uh, give a little bit background on history here, uh, which is that uh, in uh, in the early 1670s, Louis XIV invades Holland. It is parenthetically the first instance of rape warfare in modern European history, which is to say he goes for the town of Maastricht, which is the Maastricht Treaty and so forth, and he orders his troops to rape all the women as a way of terrorizing the Dutch into all collapsing. The Dutch, in response, breach the dikes, which is why you get so many paintings in Dutch uh, literature of uh, the Pharaoh's army being swallowed up by the Red Sea. There's, that's an ongoing theme in <coughs> Dutch painting. That's very effective. It stops Louis XIV cold. Uh, he no longer continues invading. However, it collapses the Dutch economy. As it collapses the Dutch economy, suddenly Vermeer, who was a, paint dealer, uh, a painting dealer in addition to a painter, goes bankrupt. He goes bankrupt with 11 children and very quickly dies. One of the things that, the, that, that Vermeer people say is, well, he was an old man, he was getting old. No, he wasn't old, he was 42 years old. He, was, he, he did the lace maker in that last year. He's at the peak of his powers at one level. But in any case, he dies quite quickly. Ben and I, I have been, if Ben is right, and we've been having conversations, it, it seems to me that it might not have been a, a plot all along, it might have been you know, the daughter and the mother sitting there saying, God, we've got this bill of, look at this, we got 700 uh, guilders to pay the, the, the bread, the, the baker, and, and then it might have just come up in the middle of the night in the conversation, well, you know, what about, maybe we could give them to a mine, he doesn't know, why don't we just give them, and it might have entered that way. I, you and I have different, and no, your, 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 your whole notion that the, that the, that the, uh, the patron would have had to know, been in on the secret, maybe or maybe not. We can have conversations, we, we can write different novels about that. But, but, but one thing that I think is fascinating, and, and I did want to get you to bring out, is that all, it is weird that all eight of the paintings that you describe as, as there's one other, we won't go into that detail, but all eight of the paintings that you describe of Maria Vermeer are here in the United States, right? So in other words, the Europeans got the good paintings and we got the Marias? And how, we, we how got did that the, happen? How we, that got happen? The, uh, we got the soldier and laughing girl at the Yeah, we got, a few, we, we got a few great ones. But we got a couple, but we got the last choice. On the other hand, we were the ones with the money for the last ones available. So, so that's, that the, that's the, the point. In other words, between 1860 Sotheby's. and 1870, 1880, 1890, the Vermeers that have recently been discovered are entering the National Museum's 
of the different countries. And Mostly the ones on that list that were owned by the patron, and which were always in the public eye. I mean, there's a, these paintings were always there. People always knew they were good. But it's Touré who starts thinking about this man, Vermeer. So even what the discovery of Vermeer is is kind of complicated. On what level is it that we started thinking about a life and delimiting an oeuvre as opposed to knowing that these were good paintings? It's, it's a, it's a, I, I, I completely agree with Wren's wonderful uh, story about the dinner table. Uh, the only thing is that I think, uh, I think that's probably exactly how it happened. I think it's just more likely that it happened before Vermeer died. Mm -hmm. Partly because, for example, this is one of Maria Vermeer's paintings. And it just seems to me weirdly uncanny that she seems to be imitating in detail from a painting that was at the Baker, a painting that was made when she was just a little girl, a baby girl. Uh, and she would have had to go see at the baker's. Now, she probably went and got bread for the family. But the idea that she somehow decided suddenly in this painting that seems too perfect for the baker to even do kind of made-to-order uh, baker painting, so to speak, I might, might, might be just a coincidence. But um, I think if there was that family discussion, and the other reason why I think it is is because if they had that discussion sooner than later, they would have had to have made an effort to make sure that nobody knew about her being an apprentice. Because if the baker got any wind of that, it's less likely he would have been accepting being fobbed off with paintings like this, that they were, they were left over. So. OK. Well, listen, we, we've got, um, I think it's a good idea for us to take a break. We can take a 40-minute uh, lunch break right now and come back at, at 1.30. But, uh, I think we have, uh, maybe you'll stay for a few minutes and have people can come up and talk to you directly about things, but I think we've certainly laid out the general idea of the theory, and now let's see what happens when, we, when everybody else gets to put their hands in the third rail.